My name is Samir Santi. I, am, I teach here at the, the CUNY School of Labor and Urban Studies. Um, thanks, thanks for being here. Thanks to uh, this incredible panel. I mean, this has been one of the most stimulating uh, conferences I can remember attending, honestly. Um, and we have one incredible panel to go. So after um, you know, two sessions looking at union organizing, non-union organizing, and contract fights, strikes, um, building member power. We're moving on to a third issue and a theme that's come up in, I think, basically every talk thus far, which is um, politics, the state. Oh, sorry, politics, the state, um, and the relationship between uh, working class struggle and political activity, public policy more broadly. Um, so I will leave it at that because we've got five incredible speakers here giving four very strong papers, um, and we're going to start uh, again, of course, bios are all in the um, in the program, but I'll just na name them. We have Vina Dubal going first from UC Hastings Law School, followed by uh, Jeremy Blazy and Aaron Greenberg of Unite Here Local 11. Um, third will be Puya Germani from Yale University, and uh, the uh, Recovery for All is that right? And so we have a we have a misprint in the in the. Program Recovery for All, a Connecticut State Coalition of, of, of Workers Organizations. Um, and then finally, Senator Nikhil Saval from Philadelphia. Uh, so I'm going to let Vina Dubal kick it off. <coughs> so um, good afternoon. Thanks for staying this late into the day. Um, of the conference, um, Stephanie, Samir, and Ruth for inviting me. It's been a real honor to get to hear all of these different perspectives, all of these different stories. It's been really, really, truly an amazing day. Um, and of course, all of the people that have infrastructurally made, um, made the day possible. So just a little bit about me before I be begin. I am a law professor, um, but also trained as a legal anthropologist. So my work is mostly ethnographic, though also legal. And I, um, for the past many years, have been doing uh, ethnographic research among self-organizing on-demand workers um, in California. And have been very sort of involved nationally and internationally with um, political attempts to raise the floor in their working conditions. So that's just a little bit of background. Um, and I will start the paper. So one of the biggest battles that labor will be waging in politics in the coming decades is not just over the introduction of invasive and exacting technologies that we've heard about today, but more specifically over how these technologies will be used together with the law to limit compensable time and lower wages. So I'm gonna start by defining this new problem in this paper before I move on to discussing how workers and unions together are addressing this or not addressing this problem. So a predictable and knowable time-based wage floor central to the movements for an eight-hour day and to a living wage and embedded in the most basic terms of the Fair Labor Standards Act is currently under political attack in several state legislatures, including Massachusetts, um, and in kind of underground in New York and in Illinois. And at least in two states, this battle has already been lost in the legislative arena, at least for now and for certain workers. In both California and Washington state, laws have been passed preventing millions of workers laboring for on-demand transportation and delivery companies like Uber, Lyft, DoorDash, and Instacart from laying claim to minimum wage and overtime laws. In Washington State and California, these workers, on-demand delivery and ride-hail drivers, that the vast majority of whom are racial minorities and immigrants, are su subject by law to a practice that I have called algorithmic wage discrimination. So by this term, by this wonky term, algorithmic wage discrimination, I mean to refer to a wage setting practice in which individual workers are paid different hourly wages, calculated with ever-changing formulas, using granular data on location, individual behavior, demand, supply, and other unknown factors for broadly similar work. 
And as a wage setting technique, algorithmic wage discrimination encompasses not only digitalized payment for work completed, but critically, digitalized decisions to allocate work. So in contrast to more traditional forms of variable pay that you may be familiar with, like commissions and bonuses, algorithmic wage discrimination, whether practiced through Amazon's scorecards or Uber's work allocation systems, dynamic pricing and incentive systems, arises from and functions akin to the practice of digital consumer price discrimination, in which individual consumers are charged as much as a firm determines they may be willing to pay based on data that they have on the consumer, like where they live and what they may have recently purchased. As a labor management practice, algorithmic wage discrimination allows firms to personalize and differentiate wages for workers in ways that are unknown to them, perhaps for as little as the system determines that those workers may be willing to accept. This practice creates a labor market in which people who are doing the same work with the same skill for the same company at the same time re may receive different hourly pay. Moreover, this personalized wage is determined through obscure, complex systems that make it nearly impossible for workers to predict or understand their constantly change, changing and frequently declining compensation. So this wage setting process informed by data extracted from workers' labor and fed into AI systems upends key moral, political, and legal baselines for work. And perhaps most critically, it is an affront to the ideal of equal pay for equal work. So if Diego and Marta are working in the same area at the same time with the same skill and seniority, they should, under prevailing legal and cultural norms, be expect expected to earn the same or at least similar amounts. But under regimes of algorithmic wage discrimination, they may earn vastly different wages for reasons that are completely concealed from them. This wage setting process is experienced by workers not only as unfair and unpredictable, but also as extremely divisive, making it harder for workers to collectivize. As one worker told me, anytime there's some big shot getting high payouts, that driver always shames everyone else and says, you don't know how to use the app. In the on-demand ride hail sector where I do most of my research, the key way, not the only way, but the key way that algorithmic wage discrimination functions is through the firm's re fundamental remaking of what constitutes paid and unpaid work time. Uber and other on-demand companies do not pay workers for what they variably refer to as non-engaged time, non-passenger platform time, or P1 time the time during which workers spend a waiting affair and which accounts for roughly but unpredictably 40% of overall time on the job. So importantly, this unpaid waiting time is not purely a factor of demand or driver quality or quantity. The goal is to keep workers working for as long as possible in order to quickly address fluctuations in demand. Thus, they are motivated to elongate the time between sending work to any one worker, so long as that wait time does not lead the worker to end their shift. In this context, the firm's machine learning technologies may even predict the amount of time a specific will driver is willing to wait. According to Uber's own data, the structures of these payment systems mean that the longer a worker labors, the less he earns per hour. An example from one driver in my research is as follows. There was a night, a night at the end of one, of one week. It felt like the algorithm was punishing me. I had 95 out of 96 rides for a $100 bonus. It was 10 o'clock at night in a popular area. It took me 45 minutes in a popular area to get that last ride. The algorithm was moving past me to get, to get drivers who weren't closer to their bonus. I was putting the work in the way I was supposed to, but the app was punishing me because it was cheaper to give the ride to someone else. So I got 45 minutes of dead time because they were hoping I would give up. It is this unpaid waiting time in between jobs that is critical to the on-demand business model as it currently exists across service and logistics sector, sectors. This unpaid time, <clears throat> which is the primary way in which on-demand firms practice algorithmic wage discrimination, has also been the central site of a behind-the-scenes political battle as labor unions attempt to solve the precarities of on-demand work through legislation. 
So my first set of goals in this talk today has been to help elucidate how this practice works, um, to make clear that it is an urgent problem, and to explain how it relates to work time. My second goal is to spend some time talking about how this problem has been addressed or not addressed, both through worker, um, worker organizing and through lawmaking in the political arena. So um, as I mentioned at the top of the talk, there are, through two very different political processes, two states have effectively legalized this firm created fiction of unpaid time. So all these terms that you see up here in the PowerPoint that Uber and Lyft created are now in laws. So um, first in California, um, in November 2020, via tw $223 million political campaign that involved widespread misinformation, harassment, and the leveraging of fake and flawed academic research, four on-demand companies facilitated the passage of a statewide proposition that you may have heard of, Prop 22. And this new law creates for the first time in US history a third category of worker, neither employee nor independent contractor, that has the real ability to bargain over a contract. Ride hail and delivery workers dispatched by apps do not have any traditional employment rights, including a time-based wage floor, though they are guaranteed 120% of the minimum wage for engaged time only. And so this was part of a huge fiction in the run-up to this proposition. You heard firm executives, um, including former Obama officials, saying this law is gonna give workers 120% of the minimum wage but only for engaged time. So one worker-led study found post Prop 22 workers are earning an average of $6.22 per hour. Critically, some drivers are earning nothing per hour. Then, last year, under the threat of a similar proposition in Washington State, a Teamsters local um, and Uber agreed on a law that legalized the practice of algorithmic wage discrimination while also securing a driver's resource center for workers. The resource center has no power to negotiate the terms of the unpaid work time or the myriad ways in which the firms extract data from workers' labor and use algorithms to control working conditions and pay. And in this sense, this law is very similar to Proposition 22 in leaving the practice of algorithmic wage discrimination untouched and creating third category worker status. Notably, both AFL-CIO President Liz Schuler and the then new Teamsters President Sean O'Brien publicly denounced this legislation and asked Governor Inslee to veto it, um, but he did not. Labor unions are currently not unified in their approach to dealing with this battle over what constitutes remunerated work and algorithmic wage discrimination. And unfortunately, this battle over time, which has implications for all workers, is taking place almost entirely in a sector where workers have very little power, where they are very difficult to organize, and where even labor unions have very little sense of how work is operating. So, um, the SEIU International Campaign Director Michelle Healy stated a few weeks ago that the international has no position on employment status in the on-demand economy, which is to say that they have no position on maintaining the legal line on basic rights, such as a wage floor. And much to the surprise of many, SCIU 32BJ, alongside the machinists in Massachusetts, have put forward a bill that expressly adds Uber and Lyft's definition of engaged time into Massachusetts law if passed thereby legitimizing the company's determination of when time should be compensated. And this is, in this is in legislative exchange for a statewide exclusive representation of Uber and Lyft drivers, but notably what this entity representing workers could negotiate over would be curtailed. A competing bill sponsored by the Massachusetts AFL, CIO, reaffirms worker status under Massachusetts law as employees eligible to receive payment like all other workers for all the time that they labor, thereby disincentivizing but not eradicating algorithmic wage discrimination and provides the pathway to organizing a union by mandating the disclosure of worker rosters based on location. So while this example of conflicting state level approaches to dealing with the battle over working time seems to bifurcate primarily in the approach to employment status, I want to be clear that this issue of detaching time from compensation and all of the accompanying problems has already spread to the employment context. As Zephyr Teachout has argued, Uber drivers' experiences with payment should be understand, 
understood not as a unique feature of contract work, but as a preview of a new form of wage setting for large employers. The core motivation of these on-demand platform firms to adopt algorithmic wage discrimination, being labor control, wage uncertainty, worker division, these core motivations apply to many, if not all, other forms of work. Indeed, algorithmic wage discrimination has been documented in the healthcare and computer science sectors where it occurs through the introduction of wage manipulation software, impacting how porters, nurses, and engineers at some firms are allocated work, evaluated for that work, and remunerated for that work. But not, and not just in the US, but actually in all over the world. I'll end by sharing ways that organizing on on-demand workers have been thinking about algorithmic wage discrimination and trying to organize it against it. And I might say that because these, are, these workers, all of whom are self-organizing, actually do the work every day and really deeply understand it, that we should think very critically about these tools or very... Um, we should look at the tools very closely. So groups like Rideshare Drivers United here in New York State, the New York Taxi Workers Alliance, and the app-based Drivers and Couriers Union in the UK have frequently demanded the traditional wage floor associated with employment status. New York City, you may know, is the one place in the entire country where this has been accomplished legislatively. But recognizing that this would not solve all the harms that arise from their digitalized variable pay, which can and do in some contexts exist alongside a minimum wage floor, these groups have more recently turned their attention to the data and algorithms that are invisible to them. In this sense, they are organizing not just for a return to the Fordist employment system, but rather attempting to, to redefine the terms of work in relationship to informational capitalism and its indeterminate futures. So as a first step, using existing and emergent data privacy laws, these workers have sought to make transparent both the data and algorithms that determine their pay, including those that determine work allocation. In the EU, the ADCU has accomplished just that. This is really an amazing group of organizing, self-organizing drivers. A few weeks ago, after years of litigation against Uber, an appellate court found that under GDPR, the drivers are entitled to knowledge about uh, the algorithms that determine their pay. I expect that this will be contested in a higher court. Um, and although it's, I think it's an amazing first step, I want to argue that transparency will not stop this practice. Um, in California, Rideshare Drivers United, represented by the legal nonprofit Towards Justice, has filed suit against Uber and Lyft, alleging that under Proposition 22, the companies use algorithms to price fix prices for rideshare services, and that they violate the state's business practice laws by utilizing nonlinear compensation systems based on hidden algorithms. And if successful, this lawsuit would stop this practice it, for these specific on-demand firms in California, but it wouldn't necessarily prohibit variations on the practice altogether. So I maintain, in conclusion, that rather than negotiating with these companies in the political arena and experimenting with sectoral bargaining laws that legalize the practice of algorithmic wage discrimination, as both the California and Washington state laws do, we need to organize against and legislate for an affirmative legal prohibition against this new practice altogether. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's a real honor to be here among such a uh, tremendously thoughtful and committed group of labor movement folks. Um, so thanks for having us. Uh, so Aaron and I are going to present the highlights from a paper that we've written together with Catherine Marino, who's a history professor at UCLA, and Zoe Tucker, who's a, another attorney at the union um, Unite Here Local 11 in Los Angeles, um, where I serve as the general counsel. Uh, the impetus for the paper is uh, was a desire to sort of recover the history of the union. I think uh, Aaron mentioned this to me earlier today. I think everybody thinks that their union is, is the best, uh, um, or, or at least really great. Uh, and w w We're no exception, and, and, and we thought it would be interesting to sort of <laughs> recover the history of how our union became a fighting, organizing movement union uh, before our time, before we joined the struggle. 
Um, and in so doing, to try to um, learn some lessons uh, that are relevant to, uh, to debates uh, that are happening now, and in particular, um, uh, debate around labor law reform, which is, as, as practicing labor lawyer, is something that uh, I can uh, attest feels often like banging your head against a brick wall over and over and over again. Um, how do I uh, go on to the next one? There we go. Okay, so um, the starting point for our um, our discussion is is the proposition as reflected in um, this excellent blog post by uh, Sharon Block um, and Ben Sachs that labor law reform is needed for unions to succeed. I think I assume that everyone in this room agrees that our labor laws are fundamentally broken, and despite the truly heroic work of General Counsel Abruzzo, who I consider to be a you know an incredible champion and a hero for workers, the system is is broken, and and many contend that until fundamental changes made through the Pro Act or more ambitiously through the Clean Slate program or something like it, that we're not going to see a true reversal of the decades-long decline in union density um, that we've been seeing. And so the question that we ask uh, is, uh, we agree with that, I think, I think I would agree with that basic proposition, but the question is how can labor law reform actually be accomplished and the promised rejuvenation of the labor movement actually be accomplished given the, the decades of failed reform efforts as those of us who lived through EFCA and other efforts can, can painfully recall. Um, and Basically, our argument is is twofold. Uh, first, uh, despite the NLRA's uh, broad preemption doctrine, it is still possible to pass creative pro-worker legislation locally, and I, I think I would push us to be maybe more creative than we have been a as a movement. And second, uh, that it's possible to turn red regions of the country blue uh, in a way that will be necessary to make federal labor law reform possible. But, and this is really the kind of crux of what we're trying to say, that deep, sustained, resourced, bottom-up organizing must lay the groundwork for the policy and political reform that we want to see, not the other way around, that the, the organizing must come first. Um, our paper is really a work of history. It's, it's very hard to, I think, present this in a clear, coherent, quick way, um, but I'll give you some highlights in case you want to read the paper. We trace uh, the union's rejuvenation, Unite Here Broadly's rejuvenation, what was HERE, um, from the, the, the start of, of the process of becoming uh, a organizing union from the uh, rejuvenation of the union's locals at Yale University through a series of militant strikes and, and organizing, originally led um, by a man named Vinnie Sarabella, who trained John Wilhelm and Carl Lechow and some of the other folks who have in turn trained many other organizers, um, including many of the, the GSO folks who are here today. Um, and uh, meanwhile, in Los Angeles, uh, there was later um, in the 1990s a revolution within Local 11, um, led by Maria Elena Durazo, uh, to force the union to embrace what had become a, a almost entirely immigrant membership. The union had not been translating materials into Spanish. It closed its doors before housekeepers got off work. And uh, through a, a truly a revolution in the union, uh, borrowing from many of the strategies uh, from the Yale struggles, the union became an organizing fighting union. Um, it... Uh, I guess we took out some of the, the slides about the UFW and uh, civil rights influences, but that's in the paper. Um, so the, the arguments that we make, um, we tell through two case studies. So the, the first case study is about how it's still possible, despite the NLRA's preemptive reach, to pass transformative labor laws or at least employment laws at a local level. And so we focus on uh, Santa Monica as a case study to tell this story. And the basic story of Santa Monica um, is that when the union was rejuvenated in the 1990s, uh, or before it was rejuvenated, 
it had one hotel that had a terrible contract. It was actually an open shop, um, and it was on the verge of being decertified. Uh, today, the union now has 70% density in Santa Monica. And the story of how that was accomplished uh, starts with one fight, and that fight was at a hotel called the uh, Fairmont Miramar, um, the, the hotel that, the, the single hotel the union had. And it was a knockdown, um, dragged out fight, five years. The organizers who were sort of part of the Yale trained leadership, um, or at least influenced by that, um, by those struggles, had learned how to build committee and how to build a strong worker organization. And through the course of a, a long fight, uh, developed uh, strong worker leadership and developed community ties to, uh, uh, or, or, or strong leadership among community supporters. And through the process of that, developed the power to change politics in Santa Monica. Uh, it took five years to win this fight. And um, then that served as sort of a template for uh, what became a geographic organizing approach to organize the entire sector in Santa Monica, of, or attempt at least to organize the entire hotel sector there, hotel by hotel. Um, not all the fights were quite so long. Um, but the key was building um, an army of workers who could, uh, who could wage these fights. And once that army was built, and it remains, you know, a, a, something that, that very much exists today. It is essentially the, the lifeblood of the union. It can be brought to bear on politics as well. So the union worked to elect progressive leaders there um, in coalition with um, a, a very powerful renters organization, Santa Monica's for Renters' Rights, and working with Lane, which a policy advocacy organization the union helped found, got to pass quite a number of laws. Uh, and this is just, I just wanna run through some of what the union was able to accomplish to illustrate the kinds of laws that, that we've been able to, to pass and enforce uh, starting in Santa Monica, and as you'll see, these have had broader reach than, than just Santa Monica. So a hotel minimum wage, it was the first city in the country, I believe, where there was a sector, um, an industry-focused minimum wage. The industry spent, uh, the focus on hotels uh, downtown, the industry spent like a million dollars to uh, to feed it, but, but um, the union succeeded. Um, it, that laid the groundwork for, um, it, that doubled workers' wages actually across the sector for many workers. That laid the groundwork for sector-specific minimum wage campaigns uh, focused at LAX, um, the LAX corridor, uh, a later uh, hotel-specific minimum wage for th the city uh, of Los Angeles, which is now about $18. Um, and now we're, we've just introduced a minimum wage proposal that would take the minimum wage for hotel workers and airport workers to $25 immediately, uh, going up to $30 by the time the Olympics come in 2028. Um, so, but this, uh, the, the point here, I guess, is that we can sometimes start small and build something that can be, can be replicated over time. A second law, uh, is a right to recall uh, that was passed in Santa Monica in the wake of 9-11 when employers were refusing to retain or rehire the workers that had laid off during the downturn despite their many years of work, including workers who had been organizing and the union won a law requiring employers in the hotel industry to rehire workers that they had formerly employed in order of seniority as business resumed. When COVID hit, as people may know, about 95% of workers in our industry were laid off, and we quickly resurrected this kind of law and began to pass it in cities throughout Southern California and elsewhere in, in the country. This happened as well, and, and, and eventually the state of California adopted a law, uh, a right of recall law that now protects uh, the jobs of 750,000 hospitality workers, uh, and it, it may be one of the, the most impactful things that, that we've done for, for workers. Third is a, uh, uh, or workers really have themselves done it. Actually, the, the workers who led that campaign were all the organizing committees from these fights who traveled to Sacramento and did a hunger strike to get the governor to sign the bill. It was, um, anyway, so then the third, um, the third campaign um, is a, or, or, or legal reform is a hotel worker, um, uh, hotel housekeeper bill of rights law. So it includes panic buttons and other protections against sexual assault that the unions also won, as Carlos spoke about in contracts, a workload premium pay provision that says that um, if uh, 
an employer assigns workers more than a set square footage, 3,500 square feet in a day, they have to pay double pay for the entire shift. Uh, a requirement that all service charges charged by the employer go to workers, worker retention in the case of uh, the change in ownership, and training on workers' rights. So now if you're an employer in Santa Monica or one of the other cities that have adopted these laws, um, including Los Angeles, the entire city, um, whether you're union or non-union, you have to adhere to these requirements. And uh, you know this is not a total reform to labor law, but it does and has, in our experience, um, been significant in leveling the playing field so that union employers are not um, having to abide by standards that are vastly, vastly higher than the abysmal standards in the non-union sector. So um, we can start small. We can we can build um, we can build things that are powerful over time. But it has all taken you know the committee and that the picture there is the the workers. Uh, uh, some of the workers at 2 a.m. the night that the housekeeper bill was was passed um, a couple years ago. So I'm going to turn it over to Aaron to talk about the second case study, which is about, well, I'll let him explain it. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Okay, so um, in the remaining time, I want to talk a little bit about the second half of the paper and some some stories that we tell that um, really help explain how that activated high participation worker-led organizing committee as the base of the union um, can make changes not just in policy in a particular municipality, but actually make changes that um, can lead to real transformation across regions and across a state. So the, um, the first example I want to talk about is Orange County. And we talk about the role that uh, Local 11 has played in this really remarkable study in political transformation over time from Orange County being the sort of spiritual home of the post-war conservative movement in the United States to by 2018, at least uh, that year electing a completely democratic uh, congressional delegation. Right now, the Orange County Democratic Party is led by Local 11 co-president Otto Briseño and has an 80,000 person registration advantage over Republicans. There are a bunch of factors that have led to this transformation that other scholars and commentators have noted about demographics, about changing political economy, about partisan polarization, about Trump in particular, and sort of negative uh, polarization. But in our paper, we're really tracing the role that Local 11 and civil society organizations like it have played in uh, politicizing, activating, and organizing into politics some of the uh, new uh, uh, you know, immigrant, non-white majority in Orange County over the last 20 years. And we show how this uh, army that Jeremy was talking about in Santa Monica and in Los Angeles was forged in Orange County as well through years of, of battle with the um, county and with the county seat, Anaheim's largest employer, uh, Disney. And we show how the union, how the, its members have helped to make political changes that have gone beyond uh, just what the union needed or, or was demanding or fighting for for a particular campaign, but have, has led to, to long-term structural transformations in the politics of Orange County. So um, as Jeremy was talking about with Local 11 in, in LA, there was a real change in, in leadership. And as Larry was talking about earlier today, leadership matters a lot. And there was a leader in Otto Brasenio 20 years ago who came and really revitalized the local in Orange County and brought the organizing committee and that structure uh, to a union that had really been, um, and a local that had been um, uh, failing its members for a long, long time. Uh, the army that ended up being the base to transform politics in Anaheim and elsewhere in Orange County was forged through a multi-year campaign at Disney in 2008, ending in 2011. In the paper, we talk about a, a lot of the really creative and militant actions, many of which were undertaken in full uh, Disney cast costumes. 
um, over the course of that campaign that also included hunger strikes, uh, massive um, media campaigns, uh, civil disobedience. But over the course of that campaign, it became clear that while victory was in sight in terms of winning the um, and beating back uh, sort of uh, cuts to health care and beating back uh, wage cuts, there was this structural advantage that the corporation Disney had in local politics that could not be overcome exclusively through collective action, that something political had to change as well. And that is when uh, the union joined with many other advocates and grassroots organizations that had been fighting this fight for a long time. And that has to do with how um, the districts in Anaheim were drawn, which is to say that until very recently, as I'll describe, there was an only, it was at large. And so the at large districts in Anaheim really benefited and advantaged a lot of higher resourced uh, white communities who were not representative of the changing demographics of Anaheim and were consistently anti-worker and consistently um, siding with Disney and with large corporations and firms in the city. So it was a, a multi-year campaign that the army of Local 11 helped to uh, become the sort of ground troops for that involved litigation, that involved arrest actions, that involved a lot of, uh, you know, multi-tier kind of advocacy. But at the end of the day, it was Local 11 along with community allies, but Local 11 really at the front, that helped to, uh, in 2016, finally uh, win uh, districted elections in Anaheim. It was the largest city in the state at that point that still had at-large districts. That structural change to create districted elections made it possible for pro-worker candidates to be elected and for the union and community organizations and progressives in Anaheim to have a voice for the first time in politics. That change that started in Anaheim in 2016 then spread all over Orange County, Garden Grove, San Juan Capistrano, Fullerton, Orange, Santa Ana all followed suit with similar kinds of campaigns and just sort of a wave that was created through a structure of organizing. Um, the paper closes with the sort of ultimate example of what this uh, army of nonviolent army of, uh, of workers and allies have been able to accomplish over time, which in the course of 2020, uh, the hun hundreds and hundreds of laid off hospitality workers of union members traveled to Arizona to become the field troops of the largest independent expenditure campaign uh, in state history, making contact with 180,000 voters in Maricopa County, which was decisive in that election, uh, and knocking millions of doors, making millions of phone calls. That operation then moved to Georgia uh, for the runoffs in 2021 and was reconstituted in Arizona in 2022. So the small local in Arizona, which uh, doesn't represent itself many workers, has a deep connection with Local 11 so that can really become the home base for a long-term uh, plan and strategy that has worked with other organizations uh, in Maricopa County to transform politics uh, in the state for the long term. So in closing, I want to return to where we started in terms of uh, the takeaways from these examples from Santa Monica uh, around policy uh, in the absence of federal labor law reform and then to Orange County and Arizona, which is first, collective action can change the law. Concerted advocacy at the local level can create legal protections that go well beyond minimum wages and address a whole range of worker issues that, again, in the absence of major federal uh, legal reform, doesn't always feel possible. And second, that labor organization can transform politics, that a, an organized, trained, structured, committed, base building organization, which labor unions can create, um, can organize workers in their communities into the political process, and can uh, really train organizers and allies to be deployed in the field in the way that they would be on the shop floor, but actually door to door as canvassers in the community for both policy fights and electoral fights for the long term. So looking forward to sharing more about the paper that we weren't able to talk to talk about now um, in the discussion. Thank you.
Hey everyone, uh, can you hear my voice okay? Yes, all right, how's everybody doing? Um, it's really great to be here. Uh, I think it's been a really wonderful conference um, and it's an honor to be on this panel. Um, and you know, the Murphy Institute is such an incredible, uh, unique institution, really precious public resource, so uh, it's great to be here. Uh, like Samir said, I'm, I'm here to speak on behalf of Recovery for All. Uh, Recovery for All is a new statewide progressive coalition in Connecticut. Uh, we're born out of the pandemic. Um, we've existed for about three years. And we unite now, we've rapidly expanded um, in that period of time. We unite now nearly 70 different organizations across Connecticut. And this includes a wide variety. Um, first and foremost, labor organizations, lots of different unions and worker centers, uh, this includes federations like our state AFL-CIO and our public sector bargaining coalition, but more importantly, uh, many different individual unions in both the public and private sectors, community organizations of many different kinds, uh, newly ascendant tenant unions, organizations fighting for environmental justice, new organizations fighting for racial justice and for gender liberation, and finally we include uh, uh, faith organizations, mainly progressive faith leaders and congregation, plus um, some powerful interfaith alliances. What binds all these organizations? I, I want to start there by talking a little bit about our coalition, and then I'm going to enter the realm of theory for a minute. Uh, then I'm going to situate this story from Connecticut within a national context, and then I'll wrap up with some final thoughts and questions. So I'll start by telling you about Recovery for All, who we are, why we formed, what we're doing. In Connecticut, uh, what we say is that we're the wealthiest state in the wealthiest country in the history of planet Earth. And all these thousands of years of human civilization, there's never been a place with as much concentrated wealth as this. There are, for example, 12 billionaires living in our state who are worth a combined total of $75 billion. Our annual state budget is $24 billion. Um, these dozen people have seized something like 15 to $20 billion since the start of the pandemic alone. And yet, of course, in the wealthiest state, the vast majority of our population of three and a half million people are struggling to survive and live with dignity. Uh, we have healthcare and childcare workers who are stringing together two or three jobs and they're living out of their cars. We have public schools, colleges, and universities that have been chronically under-resourced for as long as any of us can remember. Um, I think this crowd gets the picture. Uh, and so Connecticut is the wealthiest state, but we're also one of the most unequal. It's possible to make this state a place where every resident is guaranteed the highest quality of life but instead we have morally unconscionable disparities of race and class and gender that keep growing and growing. Now our coalition, we have a certain interpretation of how these inequalities came to be. In our state, as in every state, the wealthy few have controlled the political process for decades. They've built sophisticated infrastructure to advance their interests, and the result is year after year, austerity budgets that underfund our communities austerity budgets that protect an upside down tax structure, requiring the poorest workers to contribute a greater share than those billionaires that I was talking about. Austerity budgets that uh, help entrench and widen these extreme racial, economic, and gender inequalities. But it's not simply that the wealthy few have been organized. That's only half the story. The other half that I hope we can really focus on the more important half is that our side, the whole ecosystem of labor and social movement organizations in Connecticut, historically has been fragmented, fractured, divided, pick your synonym. The reality in Connecticut is that our various organizations have operated by and large alone, or frequently at cross purposes. Uh, we'll sometimes join together on single issue campaigns, but that's the extent of it. And don't even think about these various unions and community organizations and faith groups coming together to advance a common agenda according to a common long-term strategy. And so that means we've been largely playing defense, especially in our recent experience um, in the decade between the Great Recession and these converging crises of the 2020s. Um, so how do we move to offense? Uh, in 2020, Recovery for All formed to unite all the organizations that are fighting for a more just future. 
undertake a long-term strategy of shifting the balance of political power at the state level so that we can build a more equitable society for all. And what that means in the short term is that we lead campaigns every year uh, where we bring our combined power to bear on the state budget process, fight for policies that will redistribute wealth and power to the multiracial working class, um, and in particular, we're focused on fiscal policy. So let me just make this more concrete for folks. Um, our coalition has worked together to formulate a unified political program that we call the equity agenda. So uh, on the one hand, we're demanding various forms of, of dramatic public investment, fully funding our public schools, colleges, and universities, raising wages and benefits for essential workers, like childcare workers, long-term care workers, paraprofessionals, uh, workers who are predominantly women, black and brown, uh, provide crucial labor yet earn poverty wages, expand Medicaid eligibility for all residents regardless of immigration status, investing in public sector safety net services like mental health and addiction services, which have suffered from years of disinvestment. And to fund these investments, we're demanding comprehensive reform of our tax structure. And you know, there's a bevy of uh, ways that we want to tax wealthy residents and corporations in our state. The criteria for coming up with this program is that these are demands that are rooted in live campaigns that our affiliated organizations are leading. All the demands raise standards and expand the power of the multiracial working class majority. And the idea is it's not just a laundry list of what everyone's fighting for. It's a whole that's greater than the sum of its parts. The idea is all of our organizations are coming together and fighting for this multi-issue agenda as a unified block. Uh, we're not going to be pitted against each other on our individual demands. So the teachers union saying we want to expand Medicaid eligibility for the undocumented. Immigrant workers saying immigrant worker centers saying we need to boost funding for our public schools. The teachers union and the immigrant worker centers saying we need to make sure our long term care workers are earning a living wage. Um, and so uh, this year, uh, which is a budget year in Connecticut, we have a multi billion dollar surplus. Our rainy day fund is overflowing. Our Democratic governor submitted his, his budget um, uh, in summary. It, it is another uh, austerity budget. The Democratic legislator, legislature submitted theirs, uh, but now here we are, an independent coalition, putting forward our own agenda together. The way we fight for this agenda is through a strategy that folks across the coalition self-consciously refer to as the inside-outside strategy which I think is a term that's increasingly uh, familiar um, in many corners of the left. Um, I think uh, State Senator Nikhil Saval is gonna talk about it in, in, his, in his paper. Um, so to us, that means we are deploying mass power inside and outside the legislative arena. Inside the legislative arena, we're allied with a block of progressives who advance our bills. Uh, Importantly, a number of these elected officials emerged out of the labor or social movements. Um, uh, inside the legislature, the coalition mobilizes en masse at coordinated public hearings and lobby days. But even more important is how we exercise our power outside the legislative arena. And here I just want to uh, refer to three different sites of struggle where our coalition is engaged. First, in the streets, we are building our collective muscle to take direct action together by organizing actions of increasing size and militancy that bring together members from across these affiliated organizations. So for example, we're entering the final month of the state budget process in Connecticut, and as our lawmakers are negotiating the budget inside the Capitol, uh, we're planning a rally of several thousand people outside the Capitol in mid-May. Later in the month, we're planning a nonviolent civil disobedience where several hundred people across the coalition will take a rest. So we're very clear-eyed that the number one way we can amplify our vision of a more equitable Connecticut is through this kind of organized street heat. Second, at the bargaining table, the coalition is really anchored by a core set of left-led unions. And these left-led unions are linking their demands at the bargaining table to our coalition's legislative demands in really fascinating ways, um, deliberately threatening strikes during uh, the state budget season to advance our demands. I, I can maybe talk more about this in Q&A. And third and finally, outside the legislative arena, we're building our base through cross-organizational leadership development. 
So we just started leading an awesome program called the Democracy School. This is a regular meeting space where we bring together hundreds of rank and file leaders across the coalition. Uh, regularly to deepen relationships with, with one another, do shared political education, learn and practice organizing skills. Think about this as a kind of working people's assembly, um, which is a, a concept that a number of folks on the left were talking about um, after the Great Recession. Um, so the Democracy School is our coalition's experiment to create this kind of regular working people's assembly. And so in this first couple years of our existence, we've won some significant victories that I can share. Um, but actually, since time is limited, um, I want to step back now, um, uh, enter the realm of theory, because our coalition is just one humble, imperfect example of a certain phenomenon. Um, we can define Recovery for All as an independent political organization, or IPO. So the title of this conference is How Workers Win. Great title. And the title of this panel is Building Labor's Political Power. So let's say the question is, what do workers and our unions have to do in this moment to build labor's political power and to do it as part of a long-term plan to win? I want to join with other folks and offer a provisional yet uh, forceful answer to this question. I think in this moment, workers and our unions have to build independent political organizations committed to the inside-outside strategy. And left-led unions have got to be the anchor. So I think it's helpful to abstract from this concrete example of recovery for all and share this theoretical framework to understand what's going on. Uh, and let me be clear, I'm not claiming this as my own bright idea. Many brilliant folks have been thinking about this concept and practicing it through active experimentation for some time. And maybe I can talk about that in a moment. Um, in fact, I want to argue that the rise of independent political organizations committed to the inside-outside strategy is actually one of the most significant developments over the last 15 years. And more of us on the left and in the labor movement should be naming it and celebrating it and discussing it together. So how do we define this term independent political organization? Well, we could break it down. By independent, I mean fully independent of the Democratic Party apparatus, independent of neoliberal forces within and without that party. Political, we're engaged in social struggles over power and the distribution of resources. And organization, you know, all unionists will know what I mean. A structure with leadership, clearly defined strategy, uh, plus the resources and infrastructure to implement it. Um, and when I talk about inside-outside strategy, I want to just sharpen what I said earlier. Um, I'm, I'm talking about deploying mass power inside and outside the electoral and legislative arenas and inside and outside the Democratic Party. Even though IPOs are independent of the party, we operate inside and outside of it by working in lockstep with elected officials on the Democratic ballot line. Um, so right now in 2023, I think our mission to revitalize the labor movement has to be part of a broader political struggle to protect and expand multiracial democracy at this time in history. We're part of a united front to defeat this uh, psychotic and dangerous right wing that wants to destroy multiracial democracy. And of course, as we all know, there are backward forces that currently lead our united front. It's not a left-led united front. But if we want to defeat the right wing, if we want to build a left-led united front capable of inflicting that defeat, then we have to build the independent political power and ultimately the governing power of the labor movement and our social movement allies. And to do that, the concrete vehicle is independent political organizations. So I started talking about Recovery for All, the IPO I represent. Um, but as it turns out, IPOs have really blossomed in states across the country over the last, say, 25 years, um, especially since the Great Recession, the rise of the far right, and now the converging crises of the 2020s. And as a left, I, we don't really have much of a systematic analysis of these IPOs, but it's clear that they are growing. They come in all shapes and sizes. Recovery for All is just one. There's no platonic form. There's no modicle to replicate. Organizers are building IPOs based on a concrete analysis of the concrete conditions in their states. 
Some IPOs are coalitional formations like Recovery for All, and they focus primarily on developing an existing cross-organizational base. Some IPOs are cultivating their own autonomous member bases. Many of them are oriented around the electoral arena, and in that regard, Recovery for All is something of an exception, since we're not involved in elections, but that's because there are other IPOs in our state um, that do that, like WFP. Um, but I would say most IPOs across the country are engaged in identifying, recruiting, developing, and electing candidates to office. Some IPOs like Recovery for All are focused on the state level because that is a special terrain of struggle. Um, uh, here in New York, it was the Invest in Our New York Coalition a couple years ago that successfully taxed the wealthy. Um, in fact, state-level IPOs just in the last five years in New York, in Washington, in Massachusetts, in New Jersey, have successfully taxed the wealthy to fund public investment. That's a significant victory that I think we should be talking more about. Um, on the other hand, some IPOs are municipal. The most prominent example um, that I think is on a lot of our minds is our union brother, uh, Mayor Brandon Johnson, um, uh, now leading the city of Chicago. His victory, yeah, we can give a round of applause for that. His victory was the culmination of years of organizing by the United Working Families, an electoral coalition of left-led unions and community organizations. And the United Working Families uh, self-consciously refers to themselves as an independent political organization. So I've talked mostly about the work of IPOs and blue trifectas, where they're building independent political power, often battling backward Democrats. But we should also acknowledge the brave work of IPOs in red trifectas, where they're directly taking on the right wing. Um, so, for, for example, in Tennessee, where we recently witnessed the racist, undemocratic attack on uh, uh, state legislators Justin Jones and Justin Pearson, those state legislators we're learning um, are part of a nascent ecosystem of IPOs uh, and, and related base building organizations that are fighting direct battles uh, with the right wing. So now if I can just add a couple of tentative um, final thoughts and questions to wrap up. Uh, again, I think we need to recognize this phenomenon of IPOs committed to the inside-outside strategy. We need to better understand it. I think we need a taxonomy of these IPOs across the country. We need greater alignment of IPOs and related base building orgs within each state and ultimately across state lines. Is there a cross-state nationwide alliance of IPOs sharing knowledge and experience with one another? Um, we need to develop an offensive political program at the state level that these IPOs can take up. And I think this is particularly important at a time of effective federal stalemate. And then lastly, and especially for the purpose of this conference, how can IPOs committed to the inside-outside strategy work together with left-led unions to help grow the labor movement, raise standards and contract campaigns, win common good demands that benefit the whole working class, to facilitate new organizing in the public and private sectors, the bottom line is, if we want to grow the political power of the labor movement as part of this broader struggle to preserve and expand multi multiracial democracy, I do believe that a shared commitment to building independent political organizations offers a viable path forward that's worth uniting around. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, um, Samir. Can everyone hear me okay? Great. Um, so it's just a, what an honor to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this. Um, thank you, Ruth, Stephanie, Samir, for putting this conference together, and, and just an honor to be with uh, this distinguished group of panelists. Um, very difficult to follow that set of ec just like incredibly enlightening um, papers. So uh, what I, you know, I, I so my again, I'm Nikhil Saval. Um, I'm a state senator representing the, the first district in Pennsylvania, um, which is entirely within Philadelphia. For those of you that know Philadelphia, it's all of Center City, Philadelphia, all of South Philadelphia, east of Broad Street. It includes the stadiums and the port, um, goes up towards the river wards, Fishtown, Kensington, Port Richmond, and I also represent the Philadelphia airport. So it is really the kind of commercial and political heart of the city, also the tourist infrastructure of the city, Independence Hall, et cetera, is all fully contained within it. Um, I'm in my third year. I, in 2020, uh, I ran for and was elected to the state senate. Um, 
uh, as a Democrat and, and indeed a democratic socialist as well, a member of the DSA and kind of and self-avowedly. <laughs> Don't often get applauded for that in Pennsylvania. <laughs> Um, so it's nice to, nice to hear that. Thank you. Um, so I, uh, I, I campaigned, I, I'll, I want to talk a bit about my campaign as a way of prefacing, you know, what the, the subject. So I campaigned on a Green New Deal for housing, transit and schools, a platform of what I called mass liberation, not mass incarceration, a, a fairly um, significant criminal justice reform. And the coalition that brought me to office, I think would, I would describe as having two major pieces, one a progressive movement, cru you know, just as crudely speaking here, that had been galvanized by the 2016 Bernie Sanders campaign, which I was a pretty heavy volunteer in. I also founded an organization that came out of it uh, called Reclaim Philadelphia. Um, also the 2020 Sanders campaign, which had concluded by the, by the time I, I won office, but uh, definitely helped buoy the whole campaign. Um, and late in my primary, there was added vigor by the uprising um, in response to the murder of George Floyd. So overall, a, a, a climate of ferment, progressive organizing, um, various kinds of progressive organizations giving um, political power to this campaign. And the second piece was uh, the labor union, we've heard about it earlier today, Unite Here, um, which I was a, a volunteer researcher, uh, organizer for Local 2 in San Francisco from 2009, 2011, and um, for Local 274, in Philadelphia, which represents hospitality workers in hotels, stadiums, and the airport, as well as 634, which, is caf which represents cafeteria workers and student climate staff in the school district of Philadelphia. So together, um, this Progressive Labor Alliance was the kind of core of the campaign. We did eventually garner the support of several higher education unions in the, in the city of Philadelphia. Um, uh, Somewhat surprisingly, um, uh, still to me, um, several building trades organizations, IVW Local 98, um, the Laborers District Council, um, but together this kind of progressive labor alliance, it just organizations that don't often side with um, progressive challengers to, to, in that case, a 12-year incumbent. But together this progressive labor alliance generated 500 individual volunteers as well as several hundred thousand door knocks and phone calls we did campaign during COVID to secure electoral victory. So I campaigned um, both personally but also somewhat self-consciously as a movement politician and um, you know, somewhat inhabiting a particular type and role. And Mark and Paul Angler, who are the authors of the book, This is an Uprising, recently divide, defined ideal typical movement politicians in an article for dissent as figures who, quote, rely on grassroots organizations as an institutional base of strength and support to help reject the ingrained norms and cultures of mainstream politics. They stay accountable, not just because they are believers, but because movements offer them an, an invaluable foundation from which to operate. So while the relationship of prominent examples of movement politicians in national politics, such as the members of the Congressional Squad, to social movements on the left, such as the Sunrise Movement, is well documented. I think the power of the movement politician to engineer different sorts of labor coalitions and to bring labor and social movement coalitions together is, I think, less well understood. In other words, I think we know what movement politicians bring vis-a-vis -vis their relationship to social movements. But what is what they proclaim as self-evidently true, actually true? That is, that they, we, bring something to the labor movement qualitatively different and better than what traditional democratic politicians bring. If, as I think we agree here today, there is a weak or mediocre or bad equilibrium that is grudgingly accepted day to day by organized labor and the Democratic Party, is there a realistic higher equilibrium that movement politicians promise and can actually deliver? And not just because it would be profoundly disappointing if I answered otherwise, my answer is yes, um, uh, qualified yes, and I just want to say that just because I think we, we may, you know, as, as movement politicians, we always run and argue that we're so pro-labor and we're going to be more pro-labor than that other guy who's been there for 12 years will be different. But I don't think we should take that for granted. And, you know, certainly many labor institutions don't. And I, don't want, to, I want to talk about why I think we shouldn't take that for granted and why I think that nonetheless the answer is yes, um, that we are better. Um, and so... <laughs> 
progressive challengers to Democratic incumbents, I, I just want to detail something that I think we all know, but I just want to go through it, sometimes gets viewed suspiciously by um, labor organizations whose business as anchoring institutions in the Democratic Party is to screen out or cautiously welcome new entrants. However, loudly movement politicians claim their superior allegiance to the labor movement. Um, labor leaders pr prize several things. They count on long, some labor leaders, I should say. They count on long established relationships with elected officials who have or may achieve leadership positions to deliver for their members, which progressive newcomers cannot automatically offer. They count on reliable votes, sometimes in Pennsylvania, in particular for fossil fuel related projects or concerns which progressive newcomers often do not offer. In turn, organized labor can offer significant financial contributions and bodies for door knocking campaigns and lobbying efforts. But what movement politicians can offer and one reason why they can become major labor champions is distinct and I will call this a beyond the letter form of activism. Um, the letter meaning letters that politicians often sign in support for organizing drives or striking workers you know, in adjunct to this, they show up on picket lines that to deliver speeches that echo in fiercer terms the words that they use in their letters. I think these are the kind of bare minimum requirements of democratic politicians, which even the most mediocre, which is to say the vast majority of democratic politicians are able to satisfy. Um, in my experience, movement politicians, especially those who come out of organizing traditions themselves, can structure their work in offices as extensions of labor offices themselves in order to strategize around campaign work and collective bargaining. Labor can be an important partner in drafting questionings for budget hearings, settings in which the concerns of members can be aired to key department heads and put directly on the record. Finally, movement politicians can produce or act particularly ways in settings that are directly confrontational. They can hold hearings to confront corporate CEOs and university presidents, directly attack trustees of institutions that other politicians rely on for contributions, or even risk arrest in acts of civil disobedience. These are not actions that more traditional politicians are likely to take, given the risk to their career involved in all of them. In addition, I think there's a sociological difference. With new organizing, and what may seem not in this setting necessarily, but to many democratic politicians, as unusual sectors, traditional Democrats often lack the ability to understand who the actors are and what the potential benefit is to them, given their overwhelming interaction with, say, having spending building trades and the like. So organizing by the UAW or the American Federation of Teachers among graduate students, uh, CIR, SEIU among medical residents, SEIU healthcare among home care workers, Workers United among Starbucks workers and municipal unions among museum workers. To varying degrees, these are industries and forms of organizing that are novel to many Democrats and occasionally among unions that Democratic politicians may be unfamiliar with. They invite conflicts with institutions, hospitals, universities, and university boards of trustees that Democratic politicians like to be close to. The group of workers or being organized may be overwhelmingly young. A lot of Democratic politicians are overwhelmingly old. For movement politicians, this is fertile ground to bring the state to bear, I think, and also to organize other politicians together and, and kind of serve as a point of entry for that kind of new form of labor organizing. There are costs, I will say, I will sort of concede. Um, what movement politicians forsake in this role is any pretense of being able to broker a deal by being on equal terms with management and labor. In any situation of labor conflict, Movement politicians choose sides and add the capacity of legislative office to a given fight. The value that elected officials retain even as they lose the ability to appear impartial is that by virtue of their position, they can't simply be ignored. You are elected, you are a politician, people kind of have to talk to you. State elected officials in particular have some control over purse strings, direct and otherwise, grants, earmarks, line items, and the like. You don't lose that, actually, by being more confrontational. You just continue to have that. And so it is in part due to this that things that they do garner more attention and a commu communications they send out simply demand responses. So movement politicians can act, in other words, as adjuncts to campaign arms of the labor movement. The movement politician, in other words, is someone who can amplify and intensify the work of labor movement organizers and campaigns and help deliver victory 
help, to be clear, the workers deliver victory, but help deliver victory in otherwise hostile settings. Finally, movement politicians who proclaim their superior allegiance to organized labor can make this allegiance real in legislative accomplishments. For example, with regard to environmental justice or affordable housing that may otherwise have been lacking. And I will talk about this in a kind of specific instance from the Pennsylvania legislature. Um, I, in the interest of time, I did want to talk a little bit, not take for granted the Pennsylvania context, um, you know, in terms of what the labor movement is like, and I'll just kind of provide my own picture of it, which is obviously partial. Um, you know, it expresses features common to other states in the Northeast with some key distinctions. So Pennsylvania currently, for a long time, has had, with some unevenness, a Republican majority governing both House chambers of the legislature. That has recently changed in, in our state house. That w the last time that it changed was about 12 years ago. We've had um, uh, tr trifecta control by Republicans at various points in time, but it has largely been divided. Um, and so, just, you know, with, with all of that in, in tr train, it's a non-right-to-work state. It, there has certainly been fears of it going right-to-work, but it has not happened. I, I think it is unlikely for the near future. Um, and, you know, like many other such states, it's su suffered declines in union density without moving in a sharply rightward direction, in part because labor strength still commands, commands power even among some Republican leaders. Um, its statewide political power, I think, is chiefly constituted by the state building trades who maintain close relationships with Republican and Democratic officials alike. And in addition to commercial construction, these jobs are heavily concentrated in energy and energy-related industries, coal and gas-fired power plants, petrochemical manufacturing, et cetera. And along the building trades at statewide power, the district councils of AFSME, um, and the UFCW employed in meatpacking and state liquor facilities. Below them, I would say, in political power, this is like obviously subject to argument, but growing is SEIU Healthcare, um, an organization whose growth is partly explained by a um, book I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with here the, in the work of labor historian Gabriel Winan, um, you know, with the birth of a healthcare industry in the next shift, that is the name of the book, um, and the nature of its workforce out of the steel industries, particularly bar bargaining patterns and agreements, um, kind of explain the shape in, in part of SEIU healthcare. Um, and it is a progressive forefront organizing this critical labor force. Pennsylvania is an aging state. Nursing home workers and the like are a kind of critical labor force in that state. Um, and it's organizing it into a powerful political force in the workplace. And in addition, Statewide, there are statewide affiliates of the American Federation of Teachers, the NEA, um, locals of Unite Here, of course, as we've talked about in Pittsburgh and Philadelphia, um, as well as Unite Here Local 54, which represents workers in casinos in Chester and Atlantic City. And that's obviously there's much more I could talk about. Um, so going back to what we did when I took office, um, one thing that our office did from the outset in setting up was to hire for two out of nine total positions in the office, and it is a full-time legislature, professional legislature, a community organizer, and an office liaison with organized labor. And our community organizer was there to maintain and build relationships with progressive social movements, immigrant rights organizations, and environmental justice organizations, a position that is, in other words, an explicitly ideological position. Our liaison with labor, by contrast, had a broader remit. It wants to maintain and manage relationships with any and all possible labor, labor organizations that had had contact with the first Senate district or with my legislative work. So we hired someone who had come at directly out of shop floor organizing with Unite Here, Assault uh, with Unite Here, and who came to my staff after having been a campaign director with the American Federation of Teachers, having run successful organizing drives in charter schools and higher education. This was someone who, in other words, had been through every stage of an organizing process and had concluded negotiations, you know, with, successfully concluded collective bargaining, one, collective bargaining agreements. In addition to the existing relationships that he brought from Unite here in AFT, just that basis of knowledge meant that he could, that he could develop with other institutions. So day to day, the work of our office vis-a-vis -vis organized labor takes some standard forms. We check in with labor whenever it comes to legislation that impinges on their members' work. 
We communicate strenuously with sections of the building trades when we slight vote against them. And it is worth kind of dwelling, I'm sure, in Q&A and stuff about some of the ideological diversity among the, the various labor organizations as well, but I won't very much here. Um, we've developed legislation that labor had input on with regard to general contractor responsibility. In addition, we regularly showed up to speak for members uh, on behalf of members at bargaining sessions, rallies, pick, you know, picket lines and the like. But beyond this, we also participated in and helped advise labor campaigns, something that most elected officials usually do not do and something that comes out of, I believe, having labor campaign experience oneself or having it on staff. And I'll just choose two examples. There are two recent fights that my office recently took a strong and, and very you know, kind of intense, aggressive position on. The fight to organize and win a contract at the Philadelphia Museum of Art, led by the White Collar Municipal U Workers Union, AFSCME DC 47, and the contract negotiation and strike led by the Temple Graduate Student Union Association, or TUGSA, uh, affiliated with the American Federation of Teachers. So in the first instance, curatorial and educational workers at the city's largest and most prestigious museum successfully won a union election only to find, we heard about this earlier today, bargaining for their first contract, dragging significantly, opposed by one of the city's most virulent anti-union law firms, and girded by a board of trustees that represented the Philadelphia suburbs pantheon of plutocracy. In the summer of last year, the local authorized and went on strike. In addition to organizing members of the Senate delegation to sign letters, show up on the picket line and make calls, our office checked in every day with lead organizers on the campaign, showed up several times to the line, personally spoke to visitors to the museum, urging them not to cross the, the picket line, and helped with driving turnout to the line itself. We organized, but ultimately did not have to deploy, a contingent of DSA members to walk into the museum during a free entry day and drop a cascade of flyers from a mezzanine level to the floor of a central area of the museum. We didn't end up having to do that. I was bummed about that, but that's because they won the contract. Um, the chair of the board of trustees was one of the largest Democratic donors and a chair of then, a chair of then candidate for governor, Josh Shapiro, uh, chair, his, the chair of his campaign. This meant that very few people were willing to confront her directly. Fortunately, she was not a contributor to me, which meant that I could speak to her directly and in plain terms and state that the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania as a major contributor to the Museum of Art was not in the business of funding union busting. Labor lawyers for the museum workers, labor told me that this was one of, you know, it was a critical intervention and it was soon thereafter that bargaining began to go in favor of the union and a tentative agreement was reached and ratified. A similar dynamic obtained with the strike by the Temple University Graduate Students Union, where graduate workers were seeking, a seek, among other things, a 50% increase in their salaries. They made, up until this contract negotiation, $19,000 a year. They were seeking dependent health care, increased parental leave, and they authorized and went on strike. The university responded by cutting off students' health care and virtually unprecedented among responses to graduate student strikes ending tuition remission. Several times a day, our office labor liaison checked in with labor leaders in the Graduate Student Union and with national leaders at the American Federation of Teachers. Again, the close relationship of trustees of the university to Democratic politicians meant that few were willing to confront anyone directly. This is not simply to just laud myself, but it just it makes a difference. I, I was able to join striking students on the line and personally deliver, along with several hundred graduate students, a letter to the president of the university confront the president of the university in a meeting in Harrisburg where we reiterated that the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania does not fund union busting. In addition, one of my colleagues in the state Senate, and this is a key kind of inside piece, served on the board of trustees. And so while sympathetic to the graduate students, she was unable to take a public stance given her governing position with the university. So I arranged to back channel potential contract stipulations, you know, and potential contract changes to this state senator who could then negotiate with the rest of the board. And the combination of public pressure as well as inside organizing helped land negotiations and secure a contract um, with several significant gains for Tugza. So these, I'm gonna finish up here. These two instances in which movement politician campaigning and confrontational tactics can contribute to labor victories suggest that electing progressive officials can help contribute to labor's power beyond mere laborism, that is beyond the mere simple public discursive and merely intellectual support for organized labor. The final example I'll adduce is not um, one in which a politician one campaigns alongside and for labor, 
but one in which the labor movement can be seen in other legislative work that otherwise tends to exclude it. In particular, this is the work I associate with the Green New Deal, and in particular, its focus on affordable green residential housing. The Green New Deal has been at least rhetorically a formula that should bring organized labor alongside it insofar as politicians promise to build renewable projects, green schools, and the like with union labor. But practically, much of organized labor has operated outside the Green New Deal coalition. I know there are exceptions. Given the threats that it poses to a number of actually existing industries where members of organized labor are employed, and given the weakness of organized labor within many renewable industries. Last year, with this problem in mind, my office developed, proposed, and ultimately won in statute a program called the Whole Home Repairs Program, which offers grants for home repairs, assistance to counties to coordinate with existing programs, and critically, dollars for workforce development. Much residential home retrofit work is done by non-union contractors, a problem that has been growing for years to the point where more, most organized labor in Pennsylvania has simply given up on the issue. Part of the idea behind this program was to offer particular policy points that would trigger union interest. For example, a grant threshold that would trigger a prevailing wage rate requirement. In addition, grant dollars to the program can and have been granted directly to training centers run through organized labor. The overall goal is to reverse the declining share of organized labor's roles in residential home construction and rehabilitation, uniting the goals of labor to the movement for affordable housing and energy efficiency. To unite, in other words, the goals of decarbonization, jobs, and justice, the tripartite slogan of the Green New Deal. Um, so those are the kinds of, those are a few examples. I've argued that movement politicians can and do offer distinct contributions in, in, through their role and openness to new organizing, the ability and willingness to campaign, and finally the ability to bring labor to bear in progressive or socialist legislative work. I'm happy to answer questions and talk a little bit more about um, all of these issues or anything else um, in Q&A. Thank you so much. Hi, Jenny, Jenny Brown at Labor Notes. Um, so I wanted, um, uh, Puya, you mentioned um, the idea of uh, strikes during budget season, and I wanted maybe you could elaborate a little bit on that. Hi, I'm Don Goldstein. I'm a part-time career advisor at the CUNY Graduate Center. Um, I wanted to uh, ask a question about another more traditional form of dis disattaching time from compensation. And uh, I worked at Columbia for eight years, and the time that I was there, me and uh, almost everyone else in my department was classified as exempt managerial. Um, I never managed a single other person at Columbia, but I worked a lot of extra hours and evening hours, and I wanted to know if this issue is anywhere on labor's political agenda of um, misclassification and wage theft. Uh, question, question particularly for the Unite Here um, panelists. Uh, can you say more about how Local 11 engages workers in these kinds of legislative and political campaigns? Um, how do you overcome barriers of workers not having the time, the institutional knowledge, or the self-confidence to act in those ways outside of the workplace? on yeah <coughs> um, I guess I'll, I'll just I'll answer your question um, I don't I I have worked on misclassification for a long long time um, the, but mostly as 
as to the distinction between employees and independent contractors um, with the relationship to the NLRA and the FLSA. Um, and while the managerial issue obviously comes up a lot in the context of union organizing, it hasn't come up, um, for me at least, in my work as much. I actually thought that you were going to say um, piecework more generally because that is part of what's going on. Um, and I guess just to, if anyone, if that was on anyone's mind, just to sort of preemptively answer that, um, that what I'm describing, um, I, I had thought about it for a long time at, as piecework until I realized how much control that the companies actually had over all of the time um, before the work is allocated and after the work is allocated. And so I think it's useful to think about what's happening um, through the lens of the hourly wage because time is actually being controlled um, through all of that time, if that makes sense. Um, uh, yeah, thanks for that um, great question, uh, uh, Jenny, and, and love your work. Um, so uh, I'll just share the example. Um, I come out of 1199 New England, um, and that local is one of the main anchors of Recovery for All. Um, so I'll just describe um, how they uh, deliberately pursue a strike strategy aligned with um, the coalition's broader political strategy. Um, so 1199 New England, uh, uh, for many years has practiced um, multi-employer pattern bargaining um, within a particular sector. Uh, so uh, align all of the contracts in the nursing home industry with many different bosses um, and then threaten uh, sector-wide strikes, um, uh, partly to um, force uh, the state to intervene. Um, because the nursing home industry is a classic example of privatized public work managed by huge private corporations but reliant um, crucially on public funding. Uh, two years ago when the coalition launched, um, 1199 did something, uh, uh, sort of took it to the next level. Um, they aligned contracts not just within one sector, say nursing homes, but across the entire union. Um, so all 30,000 workers in the local were bargaining uh, at the same exact time. Um, and so, for example, the long-term care workers uh, who have the legal right to strike um, were raising you know, really bold demands um, to raise wages and benefits for this low-wage workforce, um, to win new racial equity provisions um, uh, that maybe I could talk about. Um, and, and so at the same time that Recovery for All, this 70 organization coalition is pushing this political program, you know, there are uh, thousands of workers um, who are saying, um, we're striking to raise our wages and benefits and our demands are linked to this broader political program that this coalition, our coalition is advancing. Um, if the question is, how are we gonna fund um, uh, higher wages and benefits um, for these low wage workers, it's by adopting these policies to tax the wealthy that we see um, in Recovery for All's equity agenda. Um, and, and so, uh, I can't stress enough how important that is, right? That's how lawmakers uh, took our coalition seriously, is knowing that some subset of the coalition had workers ready to strike. Um, and and that, that resulted in, in huge advancements um, uh, for those workers. Uh, but I also wanna mention, um, 1199 also represents state healthcare workers. Uh, and this is actually my, my wonderful partner, Becky, um, who leads that division. Um, those state healthcare workers do not have the legal right to strike. Um, but uh, again, two years ago, um, uh, those state healthcare workers um, allied with a subset of affiliates in Recovery for All a subset of community organizations and nonprofit advocacy organizations in the mental health and addiction sec sector. Um, and these state healthcare workers said, we're gonna join together with these community orgs and we're gonna raise demands to um, expand mental health and addiction services. They had been underfunded so much that in communities of color, we all know this, police officers are responding to emergencies and not mental health professionals. Um, and so this is another example of how, you know, a left-led union is leading a campaign aligned with our broader political program. So they worked together with that subset of community orgs and came up with demands 
uh, like very concrete, specific demands to expand state mental health and addiction services um, in, in our largest cities. And then they made those demands at the bargaining table, um, and then by definition also had to make those demands at the legislature um, under the slogan of expand services to save lives. Uh, and then the very last thing I'll say is, you know, I think it's really interesting to can think about how um, one union or various unions working together um, could raise common good demands at the state level and uh, you know, possibly make a coordinated strike threat um, in order to advance it. Uh, so concretely, in several years, in 2025, which is a budget year, all of the public sector unions across Connecticut have contracts that are expiring. Um, you know, what's the possibility of those unions, uh, you know, they already bargained together on pension and health care benefits, um, but what if they could identify a set of common good demands in alliance with community and faith affiliates and make those demands together at the state level? Um, uh, you know, I think that's a really exciting prospect that hasn't, uh, ha hasn't really been tried in recent years, but um, is definitely a possibility and is something that we're thinking about in Connecticut. Sorry I talked so much. Um, so I'll take a stab at the, the question about how to enlist the, the members in, in fighting for political change. Um, I mean, I think a couple of things. One is it really just comes down to how strong is our committee. And the reason we emphasize in the paper these bottom-up fights is that's where the truly strong committee is. I, I think probably a lot of people in this room would recognize people that have been through a fight where they had to fight back that, you know, they're constantly delegating their boss, uh, they're picketing in front of the employer, they're, they're doing public union activism. It's not that hard a sell to, one, uh, it's, well, it's, first of all, it's not that scary to go talk to a politician if you're willing to talk to your boss. Um, and second, it's not that hard a sell to, for workers to understand that you know, the government has power, therefore, you know, it, it's logical for the union as part of its comprehensive campaign to change the industry to want to change the government's approach. Um, so I think workers understand it. I think there's a general um, view within our union that, that the there's a lot more that can be asked of workers. Workers are willing, if they're invested in their union, especially if they've been through a fight, they're willing to do a lot more than, uh, than we might think. Um, the thing I sort of love most about the labor movement is that these employers, these corporations look at workers and see somebody who's good for changing sheets or cleaning the toilet, and the labor movement looks at them and sees a leader and somebody who could uh, stand up for themselves and lead their coworkers, and I, I think it's about asking more uh, of our members. It also helps if we have politicians like my colleague here um, who, who really are fighting for workers uh, who are in office. Um, and uh, our, our own, just I'll mention quickly, our own version of that is we've gotten, in the last few years, some of our own elected, um, so sort of personnel as policy. So a former um, housekeeping worker, Hugo Soto Martinez, who became an organizer, just won uh, a race for city council, taking out our main antagonist uh, <laughs> on the city council. Um, Betty, Betty Guardado in Arizona, another former housekeeping worker, was vice mayor of Phoenix. Uh, so. Uh, so it, it's great to have folks like Nikhil and, and them in, 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 in office. Yeah, I would just, um, well, I would add, I think that those campaigns are also organizing opportunities that really activate members who, who know um, the organizers or members who are themselves running, and that these political campaigns, as, as Jeremy was saying, can be sort of uh, personally lower stakes, less risky than certain kinds of job actions, but uh, really grow people's leadership through them. I think the campaign in Arizona in 2020 uh, for a bunch of members who were out of work uh, because of the pandemic layoffs um, and hadn't been very involved in union activism before, they came out to Arizona in the middle of July, it was 115 degrees. Phoenix is like the center of COVID infections in the world. They walked six days a week, had this really difficult but transformative um, experience at the end of which they could feel like they, 
they themselves beat Trump, um, that, that they helped to change the country, um, and as a result are now you know, taking leaves of absence uh, from their jobs to, to organize other workers in other shops. And I think that's an experience that we've had in many different political campaigns in many of the cities in LA County where there might be a, a small campaign for a ballot initiative that turns out to be successful and also um, helps to, to build this, this ever-growing sort of uh, army of worker political operatives um, who can really make transformative change all over Southern California and beyond. Cool. Um, this is also a question for the Unite Here folks. Um, I'm interested in this idea of using, uh, you know, local worker laws as a pathway towards uh, federal reform. But I wanted to talk a little bit about preemption um, and how you're navigating that. Um, I know there's creative ways around preemption, but at least uh, here in New York, we've encountered a lot of preemption issues when it comes to passing local legislation, um, whether it's expanding just cause or talking about um, expanding funding for our city level uh, worker agency. Uh, we've tried to make references to like, n you know, New York workers leading the nation and like new unionization efforts and like we've been told time and time again, like don't bring that up, that's preemption, you're gonna like tank the bill if you do that. And so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how to balance making sort of those references and like the, you know, the reasons to do that um, and having that sort of eye on the prize about, you know, how this connects to, you know, efforts for that federal level reform. So how do you navigate those preemption issues while kind of keeping your eye on that prize or do I just need to be talking to like less nervous lawyers? Um, my question is sort of vaguely related to that, which is this. Um, I was so impressed by the California examples of um, passing laws that cover both union and non-union workers because sometimes here in New York and I'm sure other jurisdictions as well, Unions will not support such laws because their belief is that if they do that, it's harder to recruit the unorganized workers into their union. So I just would be interested in people's reflections on that problem. That's me. Okay, that's me. Um, I, I, well, first of all, I, 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 all, all lawyers are nervous, so you'll, you, you, you make it de degrees of like uh, paranoia. But um, I, I think, uh, you know, I, I actually spend quite a lot of time sort of advising on exactly how we should message our, our, the, the work that we do. But there is a, there is a broad um, field of play for minimum labor standards that the NLRA does not preempt. So as long as we're raising minimum standards, and it can't, you know, as I was saying, it's, it doesn't just have to be wages. The federal labor law is not an obstacle. That said, there are many things that we would love to do for which it is an obstacle, and I totally agree with people like Ben Sachs who argue that perhaps the single most important thing we could be doing at a federal level is getting rid of preemption and making it a floor, not a ceiling. So, but anyway, I, I think there's a lot that can be done. It's just it's just a matter of um, of, of saying the right words sometimes. Um, the other question was about uh, oh about laws that, that, that apply broadly. I mean, I, I think our perspective is that if you lift standards across the industry, it makes it, those are things that the union therefore doesn't have to bargain over because the floor has been raised. It makes it easier for, uh, to organize, at least in theory, because as I said before, union employers aren't competing with non-union that have vastly lower labor standards. So those are some reasons we, you know, it's a way to invite, you know, it's on train to talking to workers at non-union workplaces to help them enforce their rights. So there's a variety of reasons to do that, I think. Um, so, yeah, do you want to add? Yeah, I just wanted to quickly add that, um, you know, in addition to the preemption issues in California, um, we have been facing a really scary organized opposition. Um, so some of you may have been following not just Proposition 22, but also AB 257, um, which was the fast food wage board bill sponsored by Assembly Member Lorena Gonzalez also. This particular bill at, in, its, in its introduced version 
ultimately was, or in its past version, was extremely watered down. None of the sort of just cause protections that we were looking for, none of the uh, health and safety protections that we were looking for, ability to organize over those things. It was very, very narrowly tailored to wages and that too in a very limited sense and still it is now facing um, uh, an initiative challenge this year. And there's sort of now a playbook for how to attack every single local um, local law that attempts to raise the standards in well-organized industries. And when I say organized, I don't mean labor organized. I mean where the capital is well organized. That was my very positive note to end on. <laughs> I think that uh, I think that does it. So, uh, round of applause for our final <laughs> panel. Um, th thanks, everyone. Thanks. To, I mean, this incredible panel, several incredible panels, are really, really. I mean, truly, one of the most. Um, uh, inspiring and stimulating conferences I've been to. Um, so, and thanks everyone for coming. Thanks to the, the staff for, I mean, just making this all run so seamlessly all day today. Um, and uh, this is recorded so you can watch P if people didn't, you know, people who weren't here, they'll be able to watch it. Um, and, uh, and I guess we'll see you uh, on picket line and so on. <laughs>